Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to the Corner of Wikipedia with Bang and Dang and a The Industrial Revolution Part Dose. Part do. <laughs> uh, holy crap, what a long episode. First episode, we took a look at the uh, thread industry, everything from silk, um, all the other thread stuff. <laughs> um, we also took a look at... Cotton uh, and... Right. Uh, what was the other one? Everything. Right. Take a, took a look at um, metal... Iron, steel, yep. Yep. all that stuff, yep. and coke, coke, coal, all that good stuff, and the uh, the manufactured of the um, what was it, the slide lathe or whatever, where you could finally make a precision screw so everything could be right, um, interchangeable parts. So that was a lot of stuff to talk about in season or season one. It just felt like a season, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> episode one. And this is all uh, Europe and. Over yeah, there. Yeah, Britain, mainly, at the moment. Uh, we're getting some United States stuff coming up here on part two. But before that, go over to our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Give us a subscription. Like all the videos. You can go through and like. There's 346 of them. Just go through and like all of them. Like them all. <laughs> but this podcast is, in addition to on podcast apps, it's released. Leave a comment, too, even if it's negative. Yeah, right. Um, engagement is engagement. Yeah. Um, just like this releases every Monday on podcast app, it's also every Monday on YouTube as well as all of our other podcasts. Plus, we share uh, clips and shorts and our uh, Dart League that is only available on YouTube and nowhere else. So if you guys are interested in that stuff, YouTube.com slash at Bang Dang Network. And, of course, if you're on uh, podcast apps, give us a uh, review. Yeah. Starting out this episode on literacy after we just got done with water and oh we did water and sanitation yeah. and housing and all that good stuff and we'll start out with liter literacy literally and you for further information you guys can uh, click the episode I mean the uh, the link to literacy on this if industrial you're following along page. with us on Wikipedia which right. we encourage right open your books to. Literacy. First student or omni, <laughs> chapter four, verse three, literacy. Literacy. In 18th century, there were relatively high levels of literacy. Well, maybe we should learn about literacy with these podcasts that we do. Right. Uh, there was relatively high levels of literacy among farmers in England and Scotland. Makes sense. This permitted the recruitment of literate craftsmen, skilled workers, foremen, and managers who supervised the emergent textile factories and coal mines. Mm. Much of the labor was unskilled, and especially in textile mills, children as young as eight proved useful in handling chores and adding to the family income. Why not? Indeed, children were taken out of school to work alongside their parents in the factories. Hey. However, by the mid-19th century, unskilled labor forces were common in Western Europe, and British industry moved upscale, needed many more engineers and skilled workers who could handle technical instructions and handle complex situ situations. I mean, they just need people to get... Well, they needed smart people. Right. And then those smart people to get smart on what they're getting smart about and then to teach, teach other people. Other people. Right. Literacy was essential to be hired. Right. A senior government official told Parliament in the year of 1870, upon the speedy provision of elementary education depends on our industrial prosperity. It is of no use trying to give technical teachings to our citizens without elementary education. I mean, you got to know the basics. Right. Uneducated laborers and many of the laborers, many of our laborers are utterly uneducated. <laughs> they are, for the most, most part, unskilled laborers. And if we leave our work, folk, any longer unskilled, notwithstanding their strong sinews and determined energy, they will become overmatched in the competition of the wild, which is very true. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, man, it's teaching the basic shit. That's all they need to know. Two plus two, man. That's it. Know how to write their name and read. All right. All that, all the other stuff become natural. The invention of the paper machine and the application of steam power to the industrial processes of printing supported a massive expansion of newspaper and pamphlet publishing, which contributed to rise in literacy and demands for mass political participation. All right. Good for that. That was the literacy uh, part of the industrial re revolution. We're moving on to clothing and consumer goods. Consumers benefited from falling prices for clothing and household articles such as cast iron cooking utensils. And in the following decades. I mean, that's what really helped. Right. Stoves for cooking and space heating. Right. Coffee, tea, sugar, tobacco, and chocolate became affordable to many in Europe. 
and the consumer revolution in England from the early 17th century to the mid 18th century had seen a marked increase in the consumption and variety of luxury goods and products by individuals from different economic and social backgrounds. There you go. With improvements in transport and manufacturing technology, opportunities for buying and selling became faster and more efficient than previous times. I mean, it just trickles downhill. Right. The old trickle economics, huh? Yeah. <laughs> The expanded textile trade in the north of England meant that three-piece suit became affordable to the masses. Hey, that's why everybody, everybody that's was why, looking all dapper. Yeah, everybody had a three-piece suit. Founded by Josiah Wedgwood in 1759, Wedgwood fine china and porcelain tableware was starting to become a common feature on diamond dining tables. You ain't yeah. kidding. Mm. Even though it's not china, but... Right. Man, look at that shit. Love it. Rise in prosperity and social mobility in the 18th century increased the number of people with disposable income for consumption. And the marketing of goods, of which Wedgwood was a pioneer for individuals. As opposed to items for the household started to appear. What? The marketing of goods for individuals as opposed to items for the household started. So you're individually marketing uh, certain things for certain people now instead of just for the whole house. Right, right. And a new status of good as status symbols related to changes in fashion and a desire for right. Asiatic a- a- how you say aesthetic that aesthetic um, aesthetic appeal yeah so now Gucci right like not the back then obviously but you know like that. name brand clothes and shit like that Paul we gonna get that nice apron mom been wanting <laughs> I think we finally <laughs> like got we can pace. you know the one with the rooster on it right. <laughs> every apron right. has a rooster with the blue frills <laughs> gotta get your ma something nice right. here's this brush and a mirror <laughs> <laughs> That's silver one. Oh, yeah. oh, John, you really love me. Wow. What'd you get yourself? Got myself a brand new horse. I got, <laughs> I got myself some dip. Right. And some uh some hair pomade. Right. Got some, some <laughs> dip in a in a pouch of tobacco. Oh. We are really living the good life. Right. Don't know why they're all British, but they all sound like they're from Southern. <laughs> Southern <laughs> America. Southern Britain. <laughs> Southern Britain. <laughs> Britain. <laughs> How would you do a southern British accent? I don't even know. With the rapid growth of towns and cities, <laughs> shopping became an important part of everyday life. Sure did. Window shopping at, and the purchase of goods became a cultural activity in its own right. Yeah, I can just see all the people waiting to save up money and they go past that window and that's that little dress or that hand crank washing machine sitting right there. One of these days, Charlotte. It's like in... Um 1883 when they go to town and the guy's selling washing machines right. and then she tells the husband right. we're getting one of those washing machines he's like Bleh. what did she call them they're uh they're washing machines yeah but she called them something different i don't know it's like the washing mechanisms or right. something, something like that contraptions or yeah, something. That, yeah 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 as i said window shopping and purchase of goods became cultural activity in its own right making exclusive shops uh, and many exclusive shops were open in elegant urban districts. In the Strand and Piccadilly in London, for example, uh, and in spa towns such as Bath and Harrogate. Oh, it's a nice town to call Bath, and it's a spa town as well. Prosperity and expansion in manufacturing industries such as pottery and metalware increased consumer choice dramatically. Where once laborers ate from metal platters with wooden implements, ordinary workers now dined on Wedgwood porcelain. Look at that Look shit. At them. Consumers came to demand an array of new household goods and furnishings, metal knives and forks, for example, as well as rugs, carpets, mirrors, cooking ranges, pots, pans, watches, clocks, Damn. and a dizzying array of furniture. You're a kitten. The age of mass consumption had arrived. Oh, wow. Um, George in Britain, the rise of consumerism, Matthew White. Uh, from the British Library, he says. That's what he said? That's what he says. Hmm. He said it's alive and well? It's alive. It's a, it's, no, mass consumption has arrived, baby. Oh, it's arrived and it's alive. Here and is well. the introduction of supply and demand now. Yeah, okay, look at that. This leads to new businesses. <laughs> this leads to new businesses in various industries. They appeared in towns and cities throughout Britain. Confectionery was one such industry that saw rapid expansion. Oh, uh, yeah. Candies, everything, cakes, just everything, right. Whatever, yeah. You well, confectionery, that's right. what that is. According to food historian Polly Russell, chocolate and biscuits became products for the masses. Yeah, dude. Yeah, that was a sign of wealth back in the right. day, back in the old days. You had you chocolate, biscuit, you are and you, you are like top tier, dude. And abundant of biscuits. <laughs> I got abundant of biscuits. Right. They said uh, chocolate and biscuits became a product of for the masses, thanks to the Industrial Revolution and the consumers it created. By the mid-19th century, sweet biscuits were an affordable indulgence, and business was booming. But biscuits is... Biscuits is... It's a, like a cracker, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the crackers. Like a, or biscuits can be anything, I guess, as long as they have 
cookie crackers. That's what they call them. Everything, dude. Right. And everything is a biscuit to Britons. A biscuit. It literally looks like a dog biscuit. Right. It's disgusting. It's a biscuit with biscuit. <laughs> it's a biscuit with a biscuit. <laughs> it's a North American biscuit with a British right. biscuit. Of the bourbon variety. Ooh. Gross. Gross. Bourbon, bourbon biscuits. Bourbon huh? biscuits. Hey, bourbon biscuits. Guys, don't mind that. We got a cricket <clears throat> in the old studio. Yeah, it's cricket season right now up here in the old uh, Midwest and they're everywhere. Yeah. Manufacturers such as Huntley and Palmer's in Reading, Cars of Carlisle and McVitie's in Edinburgh, they transformed from small family-run businesses into state-of-the-art operations. For them. This is also what Polly Russell was saying. In the year of 1847, Fries of Bristol, they produced the first chocolate bar. Everybody always thought chocolate came from uh, Switzerland. Or Sweden. What was it? Swiss chocolate. Um, Swiss Miss. <laughs> or Hershey, produced, Pennsylvania. He produced the first chocolate bar, but chocolate's been around for just like clumps of chocolate and shit. Right. Their competitor, Cadbury. Wow. Cadbury, yeah. Of Birmingham was the first to commercialize association between confectionery and romance oh. when they produced a heart-shaped box of chocolates for Valentine's Day in the very year of 1868. Where? Oh, well, how long shit. has Valentine's Day been around? Jeez. Heart-shaped box, baby. Is that a Good for them. <laughs> heart-shaped box. Heart-shaped pine box. <laughs> the department store became a common feature in major high Would streets. so you can put both bodies on one end and your feet intertwined? It can be one big <laughs> casket, right? Yes. If, if you guys die together, I want a heart-shaped box. A heart-shaped box. That's cool. Yeah, but they want to work. You, you put, put your or you can put your top, feet up top and then and your, your faces, faces together. And, right. And your lips glued together. Right. <laughs> it's like that one uh, mummified remains that they, skeleton remains that they found. They were like kissing, but it was found out when they examined them that it was two guys. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they were. The department store became a common feature in major high streets across Britain. Damn right. One of the first was opened in 1796 by a Harding Howling Company mm. on Pall Mall in London. Not the city. Damn. It might be. They named a whole street after the cigarettes, huh? Right. <laughs> in addition to goods being sold in the growing number of stores, street sellers were common in an increasingly urbanized country. All right. Matthew White says crowds swarmed in every thoroughfare. Scores of street sellers cried merchandise from place to place, mm. advertising the wealth of goods and services on offer. Damn right. Milkmaids, orange sellers, fishwives, and pie men, for example, all walked the streets offering their various wares for sale, while knife grinders and the menders of broken chairs and furniture could be found on street corners. Damn. Right? See, that's created a whole new industry in itself. Right. Your ch- your shit's broke? We'll fix it for you now. Uh, you need your knife sharpened? We'll do that for you, right. too. They don't even like, I don't even need a building. I'll just sit up on the side of the freaking right. corners. Uh, an early soft drinks company called the R. White's Lemonade began in 1845 by selling drinks in London in a wheelbarrow. Ew. Oh, shit. You're literally walking around with a wheelbarrow full of liquid. They're like, just dip your cup. Right. Well, with Gross. increased literacy rates, industrialization, and the invention of railway, railway, and the invention of the railroad created a new market for cheap, popular literature for the masses and the ability for it to be circulated in large scale. Like everybody, you get a book, you get a book. We all get books. Penny dreadfuls are uh, cereal literature, so kind of like goosebumps yeah. back in the day, right? Well, cool. It's a little short. Well, not short, but yeah, not very long. Goosebumps. Right. Right. <laughs> Penny dreadfuls were created in the 1830s to meet this demand. Which are short novels, short li- serial yeah. novels, right. like uh, Goosebumps, right. <laughs> <laughs> or Beatrice, and or like anything that's or, or, Beatrice or like nowadays it'd be it would be um, Ramona, Ramona and Beatrice or something like that, uh, or Beezus, I think Beezus, yeah, uh, or like Captain Underpants, like for kids right. nowadays and shit like that, yeah, right, um, Berenstein Bears, but that's kid stuff. But they also had the adult. Right. Oriented stuff too. The Garden described Penny Dreadfuls as Britain's first taste of mass-produced popular culture for the young. Oh, so maybe it was for the young. So yeah, I guess graphic, and yeah, then, whatever. You and know then what also I'm... the Victorian equivalent of video games. Good for them. By the 1860s and 1870s, more than one million. Those damn Penny Dreadfuls are <laughs> right. driving our kids to right. do violence. <laughs> Look at those Penny Dreadfuls <laughs> did to you guys. <laughs> uh, by the 1860s and 1870s, more than one million boys uh, were sold. Whoa. 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 We just took a turn here. <laughs> Periodicals. 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 It's like a book. Right. Uh, I don't know. It'd be like a, uh, like ESPN magazine or something. Sports Illustrated. Right. By 1860s, 1870s, more than one million boys' periodicals were sold per week. Um, yeah. That reminds me of like, uh, the decoder ring 
from uh, well Christmas. That was a um, yeah, but that was a radio show, right? But they all waited for that radio show, and well, right. Um, but these are books. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to wait for a book; you can just read it, right? But I get what you're saying, right? right. Drink more over, Dean. Drink more over. <laughs> crummy commercial. <laughs> crummy commercial. It's a fucking best movie. I haven't still watched it. Still haven't watched the second one. I started it and fell asleep. I was drunk. It's decent. Labeled an entrepreneur by the Paris Review, Charles Dickens hey. used innovations from the revolution to sell his books, such as the powerful new printing presses, right. enhanced advertising yeah, revenues. Why don't they do books back in the day? They literally handwrite them? Yep. That's dumb. And they expect, I think he would handwrite them and they would hire somebody. If they got published, yeah, hire a bunch of people to hand write books. Hmm. And the expansion of railroads is all yeah, helped Charles Dickens I, out. Now I can uh, sell more books than just in this neighborhood. <laughs> it's crazy that I just found out that his uh, Christmas Carol is not even his top selling fucking. You didn't just find that out because we found that out on the Hobbit episode. That's what I'm saying. Well, that wasn't just found out. It was a month, two months ago. <laughs> it's crazy. You would think that would be the number one selling book. Yeah, it was poor. Only after a death. It's like. Uh, right. What's his name? Yeah. Dude that cut off his ear. Yeah. What's his name? Uh, Phil Collins. No. Uh, the painter. Picasso. No. Yeah, it was Picasso. Right. Yeah, Pablo Picasso cut off his ear. Yeah. And he wasn't, he was kind of famous, but shit blew up when he died. That's how yeah. it always happens. It's shit. That's what, uh, it's just naming. That's what Joe Rogan actually said to Oliver Anthony. Because they were talking about something. They were like, because he thought he was going to die or something like that. And that's why he said he wanted to put out the music. Just, just so it's out there, and um, Joe Rogan was like, "Imagine if you died now, your your shit would be crazy." And they were like, ha, 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 ha. "He's wrong. He's not wrong." All right. Um, his first novel, uh, Dickens' The Pickwick Papers, in 1836, became a publishing phenomenon with his unprecedented success, sparking numerous spinoffs and merchandise ranging from Pickwick cigars, playing cards, China figurines, Damn. Sam Weller puzzles, Weller boot polish, and joke books. No, Sam yeah. Weller must be a guy from uh, the book. Nice. Nicholas Dames in the Atlantic writes, Literature is not a big enough category for Pickwick. It defined its own, a new one that we have learned to call entertainment. Oh, look at old Charles Dickens. All right. 1861, Welsh entrepreneur Price Price Jones. Price Price Jones yeah. formed the first mail order business, an idea which would change the nature of retail. You're now you can kidding. now yeah. Sears catalogs. Well, they used to like stop at your house and be like, man, this is you know, whoever they're talking to and they ordered. Or you can go up to the local. Well, that's uh, where uh, local general store, and yeah, you order out of the it, thing, right? Well, was, yeah, I always love watching like the westerns or the other like um, uh, Red Redford and Gross when he goes to his grandpa's little little store and he has all the catalogs, of what's coming out, like farming equipment and all the, all the other bullshit, dude. It's crazy. That's what happened right before the 1900s in the West. Well, everywhere really, right. they started. Um, manufacturing homes you can order in home whatever what floor plan you want whatever and they'd have it all pre-cut that shit was in the 1800s mm, that's crazy crazy selling welsh flannel price jones created mail order catalogs with customers able to order by mail for the very first time in history this was following the uniform penny post in 1840 and the invention of the postage stamp which was the penny black right uh, where there was a charge of one penny for a carriage and a delivery between any two places in the United Kingdom, irrespective of distance. Damn, you could get something that was a half a pound to a ton delivered for a penny. Right. Wow. And that nuts. Uh, well, I mean. And the goods were delivered throughout the UK via the newly created railway system. Good for them. As the railroad network expanded overseas, so did business. Damn right Railroads did. taking everything with it. Right. Population increase we're moving on to now. Well, here we You're go. Know that. The Industrial Revolution was the first period in history boom during towns, right? Boom populations, right? Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> it was the first period in history during which there was a simultaneous increase in both population and per capita income. Oh, so people are Spreading now and getting richer at the moment. According to Robert Hughes in The Fatal Shore, the population of England and Wales, which had remained steady at 6 million from 1700 to 1740, oh, rose dramatically after 1740. The population of England had more than doubled from 8.3 million in 1801 to 16.8 million in 1850. Damn. And by 1901, just 51 years later, had nearly doubled again to 30.5 million. Damn. Holy shit. Improved conditions led to the population of Britain increasing from 10 million to 30 million in the 19th century. Well, plus, people were living longer. That and 
even back then it was only 50 60 so you were lucky to live in 1850 maybe right uh europe's population increased from about 100 million the whole of Europe. Could you imagine in like the 1700s and 1600s and stuff when the average age was like 35? And that nuts, dude. Be 35 years old and be like, that's the end of my life. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, I guess you'd be working hard like a son of a bitch at you probably seven felt years old. Like you're 80. Right. So. Right. Right. Makes sense. Right. Europe's population increased from 100 million in 1700 to about 400 million by 1900. No shit. And it's probably tripled since then. Wow. Mm. The growth of modern industry since the late. Well, 18th. now we're going to urbanization. Oh, urbanization! The growth of modern industry since the late 18th century led to massive urbanization and the rise of new great cities, first in Europe and then other regions, as new opportunities brought huge numbers of migrants from rural communities into urban areas. See, that's why too. <clears throat> Most people are spread out, and everybody's like flocking where everything's at, and then build around it. Right. That's how cities work <laughs> exactly in the year of 1800 only three percent of the world's population lived in cities compared to nearly 50 percent by the end by the beginning of the 21st century Damn. wow manchester had a population of 10,000 in 1717 but by the year of 1911 1911 it had burgeoned to 2.3 million people 200 years though i mean it's a massive increase i guess but 200 years mm. <laughs> Yeah, but for three, four, five what was the, years before that. What was the population of New York in 1750? Of New York? I bet you it was a couple few hundred thousand already. It had to have been. Right. Probably so on, probably Man, on Manchester's not a good representation. How big is Manchester now? I bet it's not 2.3 million. I bet you it's more. You think so? Oh, Manchester's huge, so yeah. Population is 550-something thousand. What? The city is 551,000. What's all of it? Sixth in London. And they got like a whole thing. No, just a whole. How big is that's huge? Manchester, right there, man. You tell me, there's only five hundred thousand people live in that. It's only the city is only forty four point six square miles. Forty four point six square miles, and the city population is five hundred fifty one thousand people. That's a lot. Urban population. It's two million. Two point seven million. Okay, so yeah, right, it's about, almost three million then. Two so million. pretty much like Detroit, right? And then Metro Detroit, right? I get it. That's pretty good. I mean, it didn't really. <clears throat> There was not ten million people, or two point. There was not two million people in the city of Manchester when what this article is talking about. Maybe they're probably talking about Greater Manchester. Had to have been. How big do you think Manchester was back then? Not that big, right? No way. It had two point three million people. Crazy. Nineteen eleven. Nah. And it only went down. So what the hell happened in Manchester that it lost one point seven million people? Well, now we can all move on to effect on women and family oh, life. Geez. Uh, the the production of alcohol <laughs> right. caused a lot of beatings. Women's historians have debated the effect of the Industrial Revolution and capitalism generally on the status of women. Taking a pessimistic side, Alice Clark argues that when capitalism arrived in 17th century England, it lowered the status of women as they lost much of their economic importance. Right. We don't need you to sew no more. We don't need you to do. Right. We don't need you to cook all this food no more because now we can just go get it. Clark argues that in the 16th century England, women were engaged in many aspects of industry and agriculture. Right. The home was a central unit of production and women played a vital role in running farms and in some trades and landed estates. Nice. Mm -hmm. Their useful economic roles gave them a sort of equality with their husbands. However, yeah, now the husbands are off right. working in uh, smelting places and shit. Right. Well, Clark argues as capitalism expanded in the 17th century, there was more division of labor with the husband taking paid labor jobs outside the home and the wife was reduced to unpaid housework. Uh, but... So got that shiny new cast iron stove at, one right. <laughs> at uh, Christmas the, time. She gets the thanks. All right. Um, middle and upper class women were confined to an idle domestic existence, supervising servants. Lower class women were forced to take poorly paid jobs. Uh, capitalism, therefore, had a negative effect on powerful women. Get the hell out of here. I don't want to hear anything about bad. I don't want you to ever talk bad about capitalism. <laughs> In a more positive interpretation, Ivy Pinchbeck argues that capitalism created the conditions for women's emancipation. Exactly. It gave them freedom. Right. Well, it gave them the, the path to freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Tilly and Scott have emphasized that the continuity in the status of women find in three stages in English history. 
Well, they start with the pre-industrial era. Production was mostly for home use, and women produced much of the needs of the households. Right. Clothes, everything. Right. The second stage was the family wage economy of early industri- industrialization, where the fa- entire family depended on the collective wages of its members, so everybody had to everybody. work, including husband, wife, children. Exactly. The third or modern stage is the family consumer economy, in which the family is the site of consumption, and women are employed in large numbers in retail and clerical jobs to support rising standards of consumption. Damn right. Ideas of thrift and hard work characterized middle class families as the industrial revolution swept Europe. I mean, think about it. Think about it back then. Men, they need somebody to be in these shops and stuff like that. Men, and you, back then, you weren't going to see a guy sitting, unless he's a bartender or a blacksmith, where he's just confined to this low area all day long, like a candy shop or anything like that. General stores? General stores are totally different because you're oh. doing all kinds of different stuff. You're just sitting there. You can take inventory a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Anything. But the guys are going to be usually out doing the hard shit. Yeah, maybe. And what guys that don't want to do that, they are the ones that you see at the candy shops and stuff. But they needed the women to be the clerks at the, the banks and the, um, the clerks at the meat markets. And somebody had to be in the livery to help the uh, delivery men. Is that what they call <laughs> the delivery men? The stables? <laughs> um I don't think so, man. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. All right. No. All right. No. Not once in our uh, Wild West stories did we hear of a bank robbery that women were the clerks. Of a bank? Yeah. Yeah, probably not a bank. Yeah, you're right. But they were like a secretary or something there. Oh, sure. Of course. They're the ones. They did the work that the, the clerks didn't want to do. They did, the, the clerks just wanted to go and sit behind a desk all day and collect people's money. And they give all that paperwork and receipts to the girls. Exactly. <laughs> Ideas of thrift and hard work characterized middle class families as the Industrial Revolution swept Europe. Said that these values were displayed in Samuel Smiles' book, Self Help, in which he states that the misery of the poorer classes was voluntary and self imposed, the results of idleness, idle, idleness, thriftlessness, intemperance, and misconduct. Wow. wow. Right. It's just like t- today. Right. Today, Junior, you are poor and want to help or better yourself, go out and find a better job. Right. And then those who don't, shit, you, you, you don't. That. Right. Well, let's move on to labor conditions, social structure, and working conditions. In terms of social structure, the Industrial Revolution witnessed the triumph of a middle class of industrialists <laughs> and businessmen over a landed class of nobility and gentry. Ordinary working people found increased opportunities for employment in mills and factories. But... These were often under strict working conditions with long hours of labor dominated by a pace set by the machines. Oh, hey, too bad. As of late of 1900, most industrial workers in the United States of America, they work 10 hours a day and some 12 hours in the steel industry, yet only earn 20 to 40 percent less than the minimum deemed necessary for a decent life. However, most workers. What is what is OK? First of all. What is the standard of a decent life? Right, exactly. Does this dude have food on the table, roof over the head, and uh, everything? He don't have all the fancy gadgets. Right. And he didn't have the that. china right. and the and the uh, ceramics. Right. He's fixing his shack that he lived in for years. He didn't right. have a brand new house. Hmm. So piss off. However, most workers in textiles, which was by far the leading industry in terms of employment, were women and children. Of course. For workers of the laboring classes, industrial life was a stony desert, which they had to make habitable by their own efforts. Hey, man. Harsh working conditions were prevalent long before the Industrial Revolution took place. Yeah, I mean, of course. On. If you're going to. They were even more. What are you talking about? Obviously, it's they were easier now. I was going to say, obviously, they were prevalent long before when you really had, had to do to. thing by hand. Right. Jeez. Imagine when they made the first spade that get pulled behind the donkey. All right. Before, you're just using a freaking. The spade that got pulled behind a donkey was way before Industrial Revolution. Right. I'm saying, imagine before that. Shit. Or just imagine with the spade behind a donkey. How many times you get drugged by that damn thing? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid donkey. Stupid donkey. Uh, jackass. <laughs> yeah, jackass. Pre-industrial society was very static and often cruel. Child, child labor, dirty living conditions, long working hours were just as prevalent before the Industrial Revolution. Of course they were. Long and, before. And guess what? And long after as well. Imagine the people who had to build the uh the pyramids in Egypt. <laughs> I'm talking about dirty living conditions and long working hours. No, because the people that built the pyramids in Egypt had uh better technology than we did. You ain't getting that weird. <laughs> no weird. <laughs> no, seriously. Right. Well, if you go by the um there's this dude he theorizes coincidentally back around about the time of the Bible started that there was a reset and um 
and civilization that the people that built the pyramids were at our level of technology or maybe even surpassed. And then we reset where we had to go back to the stone ages and shit like that. And then boom, now we're here where we are now. Um, that would be after the Noah's Ark. Well, it's before everything Bible is when this is like, he's, he, he has a theory of reset. And then that's when the stuff in the Bible and stuff happened. Um, but other than that, it is, it is shown we have not been able to recreate the pyramids. No. Even with all the technology we have nowadays, nope. we can't get those precise cuts because those things were precision no. cut, dude. I don't even think Who they knows? I don't even think they can reproduce the uh Coliseum. Yeah, of course you could. Mm. You're not to be that that uh strong and last all them years. Half they can make a new one, but how long is it gonna last? Half of it's fell. Deteriorate and yeah, how old is it? Well, it's because it was made out of clay and concrete and stuff. Not concrete, I mean, but just um, like clay and dirt and water. No, rock is made from. We already limestone or all right, lime. limestone or um, what's the one stuff? Yeah, the other not limestone. Um, something stone. I was just watching a uh, how it's not how it's made. Hundred marbles, a quarry. What's Brim, a quarry? Brimstone. Yeah, yeah, the quartz. Um, quartz. Yeah, not quartz, but it's a it's a rock though. Right. And uh, yeah, that's what they were using back in the day. Either either or, we can't recreate it. So who knows? All right, moving on to factories and urbanization. That we already did that. Industrialization led to the creation of the factory. The factory system contributed to the growth of urban areas as large numbers of workers migrated into the cities in search of work in the factories. Yep. No, nowhere was this better illustrated than the mills and associated industries of Manchester, nicknamed Cottonopolis. Yeah, they they were like some manufacturing people in the UK. Already went through this. And the world's first industrial city, Manchester was. Manchester experienced a six times increase in its population between 1771 and 1831. Bradford grew by 50% every 10 years between 1811 and 1851. Fantastic. And by 1851, only 50% of the population of Bradford were actually born there. Wow. Ooh. In addition, between 1815 and year 1913, 20% oh, 39. of... 39. Yeah, 1939, 20% of Europe's population... How the hell can you have a between the year of 1815 and 13? <laughs> All right. <laughs> We went backwards. Right. So 1815, between 1815 and 1939, 20% of Europe's population, they left home. They pushed. So where are you going? I'm pushed leaving, by I'm leaving home. Right. <laughs> they were pushed by poverty, a rapidly growing population, and displacement of peasant farming and artisan manufacturing. All right, you little peasant farmer. Even though I'm feeding you guys, but I'm so lonely, huh? Bastards. Sorry. Right. They were pulled abroad by the enormous demand for labor overseas, the ready availability at land of land and cheap transportation as well. Still, many did not find a satisfactory life in their new homes, leading 7 million of them to return back to Europe. Damn. This mass migration had large demographic effects. In, 19, in 1800, less than 1% of the world population consisted of overseas Europeans and their descendants. By the year of 1930, they represented 11%. The Americas felt the brunt of this huge immigration, largely concentration in the United States, right? Like New York and Boston and all that. Clearly. Right. For much of the 19th century, production was done in small mills, which were typically water powered and built to serve local needs. Later, each factory would have its own steam engine and a chimney to give an efficient draft through its boiler. In other industries, the transition to factory production was not so divisive. Ooh. Some industrialists try to improve factory and living conditions for their workers. Well, some people. One of the earliest such reformers was Robert Owen, known for his pioneering efforts in improving, improving conditions for workers at New Lanark Mills, and often regarded as one of the key thinkers of the early socialist movement. By 1746, an integrated brass mill was working at Warmly near Bristol. Cool. Raw material went in at one end and was smelted into brass and was turned into pans, pans. <laughs> <laughs> pans and pans. Pans and pans. It was turned into pans, pins, wire, and other goods. No oh, shit. Uh, housing was provided for workers on the site. Well, good for them. Man. Josiah Wedgwood, we've heard his name, and Matthew Bolton, whose Soho manufacturing was completed in 1766, were other prominent early industrialists who employed the factory system. I mean, yeah. Fantastic. Good shit. Let's move to child labor. Mm, they're small enough to fit in these little crevices. Exactly. The uh, Industrial Revolution led to a population increase, as we said before. But the chances of surviving childhood did not improve throughout the Industrial Revolution. Although infant mortality rates were reduced markedly, so but they're still dying at between like, uh, before they got to like 10. 
Probably most before they even got to Five, two or three. Right. Toddler. There was still a limited opportunity for education, and children were expected to work. Employers could pay a child less than an adult, even though their productivity was comparable. There was no need for strength to operate an industrial machine. And since the industrial system was new, there were no experienced adult laborers. All right. Like, hey, man, I got two weeks experience. <laughs> right. This kid, when he's this like. Dude's the, the dude that has two weeks experience is the, uh, uh, you know, the elder of right. the group pretty much. Right. And then the kid starts at like five by the time he's like 20 and he's. He's training other people. He's like, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. <laughs> They're like, what? <laughs> Damn, dude. You can't even. You're 17. <laughs> you can't even buy cigarettes yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just roll my own. <laughs> We're doing it for a long time. Back in the day. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> back, <laughs> back when I first started. Shit, boy. You little whippersnappers. How old are you, 10? Shit. Wait till you get 17. How old are you, 10? Yeah. By your age, I was already in the business for eight years. <laughs> By your age, I was divorced twice. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know why they're Southern. <laughs> and I, back, in, back when I was your age, I was already divorced twice, my lad. Well, I don't know. <laughs> this made child labor and the labor of choice for manufacturing in the early phases of the Industrial Revolution between 18th and 19th century. Child labor was like, Gotcha, boys. Of course. In England and Scotland. Still the same. It's a preferred method in the Philippines and right, all over right now. Everywhere. In England and Scotland in the year of 1788, two-thirds of the workers in 143 water powered cotton mills were described <laughs> as children. Described. How, how would you describe those workers? <laughs> well, I say they're I small. <laughs> they don't know too much. <laughs> Brain's not fully developed. Uh, they, cons- they, wear, they wear a size three shoe. Uh, we don't give them 15-minute breaks. We give them 15-minute naps. That's what we're doing. We're the only mill around here that provides nap time, damn it. Paint nap time. <laughs> I won't go that far. <laughs> Well, child labor existed before the Industrial Revolution, Obviously. but with the increase in population, education became more visible. Clearly. Many of this was like the modern... It was like an M song. <laughs> with the increase in population, education, <laughs> it became more visible, divisible, divisible. <laughs> Napkins. <laughs> using way too many ends. <laughs> you're, 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 way, you're using way too many children. <laughs> There's way too many children in the building. <laughs> children on the factory floor. <laughs> Getting... <laughs> <laughs> Why are the dogs getting paid more? Wait, it's time for their nap. <laughs> <laughs> napkins. <laughs> you had too many children napkins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, many children were forced to work in relatively bad condi- conditions for much lower pay than their elders. 10 to 20% of an adult's male, uh, male's wage. Wow. Mm. That sucks. And the adults only making... F- 25 cents. All right. Uh, reports were written detailing some of the abuses, particularly in the coal mines and textile factories, and of these course, helped to popularize dude. the children's plight. The public outcry, especially among the upper and middle classes, helped stir change in the young workers' welfare. Did it, though? It's because those workers were still treated as slaves. Pretty much. You know what I mean? Right. Well, um, <clears throat> there's this dude that goes around just towns... That have stigmas around them. Right. But, uh, he's been to Appalachia and like oh, the, the mines around right. there. Um, it's a black but, guy, isn't he? No, it's a white guy. He, uh, it's a black guy that does that too. I'm sure there is. But this guy I'm talking about, he has like several family members of people that worked in the mines back in the day where uh, they, their contract of that, whatever mining company they worked for, they paid them only in, uh, they didn't pay them in like legit money. They paid them in the mine money. So it was like the mine's own currency, right. and they could only spend their money with the mine. Like the mine would provide like goods and services, and they but whatever they got paid, they couldn't go out to like another city and buy shit like right. at a store and shit. Right. It had to all right. be purchased through the mine company. Right, and basically, the mine company owned the saloon and owned the maybe you had to stop at a place, whatever they the general that store, took that money, right? The general stores, but it wasn't like I'm paying you a dollar of American money. You no. got paid mine money, right? Well, it's pretty fucked up. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty much. All that money went back to the mine and to do this. Mm. Gro- that's some greasy shit, boys. Yeah, that's some greasy shit. Go ahead, bud. Politicians of the government tried to limit child labor by law, but factory owners resisted. Some felt that they were aiding the poor by giving their children money to buy food to avoid starvation, and what? others simply welcomed the cheap labor, clearly. In 1833 and 1844, the first general laws against child labor, which were the Factory Acts, were passed in Britain. 
Children younger than nine were not allowed to work. Children were not permitted to work at night. And the workday of youth under age 18 was limited to 12 hours. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> that, that's not a limitation at all. I mean, it is. Motherfuckers still got to work 12 hours. Yeah, but you can't work at night. <laughs> okay. So you got to go to work at 5 in the morning. <laughs> oh, well, that's a shitty ass law. Factory inspectors supervise the execution of the law. However, their scarcity made enforcement difficult. Right. I mean, and they didn't true. care when they were there. Right. About 10 years later, the employment of children and women in mining was forbidden. Uh-huh. Well, good for them. Although laws such as these decreased the number of child laborers. Child labor remains significantly present in Europe and the United States until the 20th century. For sure. I mean, for sure. And a lot of it ain't like what we're seeing today. I mean, a lot, actually, it is. Of course it was. It is. Because, like, in the Philippines and, like, Papua New Guinea and stuff like that, that's, this is, they're still living in these times where the, there's no, you gotta get out. Everybody that lives in this household Over has there to in get those out. Those types of countries, it's the same thing right here. Over there in those types of countries, the men are out doing the right. digging, the trenching, right. that type of shit, right. the mining, whatever. And the women and uh, kids are in doing whatever they can. The fabric factories, right. making shoes, making what clothing, making selling, whatever the hell. Selling uh, making turnips. pottery, making. S- selling turnips off their flatbed truck. I was sitting there. Selling turnips on a flatbed. They didn't even have a flatbed truck. They had a flatbed flatbed wagon. Right. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. And they were all flatbed. Right. Well, it moves us to the organization of labor. The Industrial Revolution concentrated labor into mills, factories, mines, thus facilitating the organization of combinations or trade unions to help advance the interests of working people. The power of a union could be could demand better terms by withdrawing all labor and causing a consequent cessation of produ- production. Employers had to decide between giving in to the union demands at a cost to themselves or suffering the cost of the lost production. Skilled workers were difficult to replace, and those were the first groups to successfully advance their conditions through this kind of bargaining. Well, yeah. That's what happens when there's not that many skilled workers. They got to leverage. Right. The main method the unions used to effect change was strike action. Many strikes were painful events for both sides, the unions and the management. In Britain, the Combination Act of 1799 forbade workers to form any kind of trade union until it was repealed in 1824. Damn. Even after this, unions were still severely restricted. One British newspaper in 1834 described the unions as the most dangerous institutions that were ever permitted to take root under shelter of law in any country. (laughs) Man, this dude hates unions. (laughs) 1832, the Reform Act extended the vote in Britain but did not grant universal suffrage. That year, six men from Tulpuddle in Dorset founded the Friendly Society of the Agricultural Laborers to protest against to protest against the gradual lowering of wages in the 30s of the 1800s. Mm, they refused to work for less than 10 shillings per week, <laughs> although by this time wages had been reduced to seven shillings per week and were due to be further reduced to six. Wow. 1834, James Frampton, a local <laughs> landowner, wrote to Prime Minister Lord Melbourne uh, to complain about the union, invoking an obscure law from 1797 prohibiting people from swearing oaths to each other, which the members of the Friendly Society had done. Wow. Uh-huh. Weird. Six men were arrested, found guilty, and transported uh, to Australia. Wow. They became known as the Tolpuddle Martyrs. In the 1830s and 40s, the Chartist movement was the first large-scale organized working-class political movement that campaigned for political equality and social justice. Oh, shit. The charter, its charter of reforms received over 3 million signatures, but was rejected by the parliament without any consideration. Of course. Working people also formed friendly societies and cooperative uh, societies as mutual support groups against times of economic hardships. Enlightened industrialists such as Robert Owen, he supported these organizations to improve the conditions of the working class. I mean, come on, you gotta make the workers happy. Unions slowly overcame the legal restrictions on the right to strike. 1842, a general strike involving cotton workers and colliers were organized through the Chartist movement, which stopped production across Great Britain. Eventually, effective political organization for working people was achieved through the trade union, who, after the extensions of the franchise in 1867 and 1885, they began to support socialist political parties that later merged to become the British Labour Party. Mm, good for them, huh? Party. The rapid industrialization of the English economy cost many craft workers their jobs. Damn right. The movement started with first with lace and hosiery workers near yeah. Nottingham and spread to other areas of the textile industry. 
Many weavers also found themselves suddenly unemployed since they could no longer compete with machines, Damn right. which only required relatively limited and unskilled labor to produce more cloth than a single weaver. Yeah. Many such unemployed workers, weavers, and others turned their animosity towards the machines that had taken their jobs. They took our jobs. It's like Terminator, rise of the machines. All right. <laughs> uh, and began destroying factories and machinery. Oh, man. These attackers became known as Luddites, supposed to be follows, followers of Ned Ludd, who was a folklore figure. Oh, shit. Oh, Ned Ludd, huh? the fuck is it, Ned Ludd? It's a guy. He's wearing a dress. He is supposed to have broken two stocking frames in a fit of rage. Which are, okay, so. Damn. The first attacks of the Luddite movement began in the year of 1811. The Luddites rapidly gained popularity, and the British government took drastic measuring, using the militia or army to protect the industry. Those rioters were caught, were tried, and hanged, or transported for life. Unrest continued in other sectors as they industrialized, such as with agricultural laborers in the 1830s, when large parts of southern Britain were affected by the captain's swing disturbances. Threshing machines were a particular target, and hayrick burning was a popular activity. What, what hayrick? What's a hayrick? A hayrick burning? Bale hay. No shit. They throw them in plants? In the factories? Why don't burn the fucking bales in the middle of the field? Well, that's cool. However, the riots led to the first formation of trade unions and further pressure of reform. Good Look for at them. That. Right. That's going to bring us to the shift in production's center of gravity. Mm. Uh, the traditional centers of hand textile production, such as India, parts of the Middle East, and later China, could not withstand the competition from machine-made textiles, which over a period of decades destroyed the handmade textile industries and left millions of people without work, many of whom starved. Oh, man. The Industrial Revolution generated an enormous and unprecedented economic division in the world, as measured by the share of manufacturing output. Dude, look how big the United States jumped. So a share of the total world man manufacturing output, Europe was 23.2 in 1750. In 1900, they went to 62%. Uh, United States was 0 0.1 in or 1750, and by 1900 were 23.6%. Japan was 3.8 in 1750 and went to 2.4 in 1900. Look how big the rest of the world just dropped. Man, the rest of the world was 73.0% of the share of manufacturing in 1750, and by 1900, were only 11. Because mm. the rest of the world didn't have ma the, ma uh, the machines. That's true. If they did, definitely not as much as Britain and the United States had. Wow. Well, this takes us to cotton and an expansion of slavery. Cheap cotton textiles increased the demand for raw cotton. Previously, it had primarily been consumed in subtropical regions where it was grown, with little raw cotton available for export. Right, they're using most of that shit. Like, man, we don't, we can't get rid of this shit, but it's, it's ours. Right. Consequently, prices of raw cotton rose. British production grew from two million pounds in 1700 to five million pounds in 1781 to 56 million pounds in 1800. The invention of the cotton gin by American Eli Whitney in 1792 was a decisive event. It allowed green seed cotton to become profitable, leading to the widespread growth of the large slave plantation in the United States, Brazil, and the West Indies. 1791, American cotton production was about 2 million pounds, soaring to 35 million by 1800. Half of this was uh, exported. America's cotton plantations were highly efficient and profitable and were able to keep up with demand. The United States Civil War created a cotton famine that led to increased production in other areas of the world, including European colonies and Africa. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no matter why. Isn't it ironic? <laughs> well, care. now, here we go. Uh, we're going to look at the effect on the environment of the Industrial Revolution. The origins of the environmental movement lay in their response to increasing levels of smoke pollution in the atmosphere during the Industrial Revolution. Emergence of great factories in the con Concomitant and immense growth in coal consumption gave rise to an unprecedented level of air pollution in industrial centers. After 1900, the large volume of well, after 1900, the large volume of industrial chemical discharges added to the grown load of untreated human waste. Hmm. The first large-scale modern environmental laws came in in the form of Britain's Alcali Acts, passed in 1863 to regulate the deleterious air pollution which was gaseous hydrochloric acid Ooh. given off by the LeBlanc process used to produce soda ash. Ooh, I'm bad. An Elkley inspector and four sub-inspectors were appointed to coib this pollution. Responsibilities of the inspectorate were gradually expanded, culminating in the Elkley Order of 1958, which placed all major heavy industries that emitted smoke, grit, dust, and fumes under supervision. The manufactured gas industry began in British cities in 1812, between 1812 and 1820. 
technique used produced highly a toxic effluent that was dumped into sewers and rivers. Yeah. The gas companies repeatedly sued in nu- nuisance cases. Uh, they usually lost and modified the worst practices. Mm. The city of London repeatedly indicted gas companies in the 1820s for polluting the Thames River and poisoning its fish. Finally, Parliament wrote company charters to regulate toxicity. In the city, in the city, <laughs> no more dumping pollutants <laughs> in our water, our water. <laughs> no more poison our fish, no more poisoning the fish. <laughs> Why can't you just be clean? <laughs> <laughs> toxicity. <laughs> the industry reached the United States around 1850, causing pollution and lawsuits as well. <laughs> okay. In industrial cities, local experts and reformers, especially after 1890, took the lead in identifying environmental hmm. degradation and pollution and initiating grassroots movements to demand and achieve reforms. Uh-oh. Typically, the highest priority went to water and air pollution. Obviously. The Coal Smoke Abatement Society was formed in Britain in 1898, making one of the oldest environmental non governmental organizations. Oh, shit. It was founded by artist William Blake Richmond, frustrated with the pall cast by coal smoke. Right. Okay. Although there were earlier pieces of legislation, the Public Health Act of 1875 required all furnaces and fireplaces to uh, consume their own smoke. It also provided for sanctions against factories that emitted large amounts of black smoke. Ooh. The provisions of this law were extended in 1926 with the Smoke Abatement Act to include other emissions such as soot, ash, gritty particles, and to empower local authorities to impose their own regulations. Right. Now. Well- this would take us uh, to the continental Europe, not just Britain. The Industrial Revolution in continental Europe came later than in Great Britain. It started in Belgium and France, then spread to the German states by the middle of the 19th century. In many industries, the involved application of technology developed in Britain and in new places. This involved that. Typically, the technology was purchased from Britain or British engineers and entrepreneurs. They moved abroad in search of new opportunities. By the year of 1809, part of the Ruhr Valley in West uh, Westphalia was called Miniature England because of similarities to the industrial areas of Britain. Most European governments provided state funding to the new industries. In some cases, such as iron, the different availability of resources locally meant that only some aspects of the British technology were adopted. Oh, shit. All right, moves us to Austria-Hungary, or Germany. Right. The Habsburg Realms, which became Austria-Hungary in 1867, included 23 million inhabitants. Damn. In 1800, growing to 36 million by 1870. Look at these guys. Nationally, the per capita rate of industrial growth averaged around uh, 3% between 1818 and 1870. Pretty good. However, there are strong regional differences. The railway system was built in 1850 to the 73 period. Before they arrived, transportation was very slow and expensive. Clearly. In the Alpine and Bohemian regions, which is modern-day Czech Republic, proto-industrialization began by 1750 and became the center of the first phases of the Industrial Revolution after 1800. Look at that shit. The textile industry was the main factor, utilized in mechanization, steam engines, and the factory system. In the Czech lands... The first mechanical loom followed in Vansdorf in 1801. That's a quote from somebody, I guess. With the first steam engines appearing in Bohemia and Moravia just a few years later. Look at that shit. Good for these guys. Textile production flourished, particularly in Prague and Bruno. No, Bruno. Oh, it's Brunn in German. Brunn. Brunn. I don't know. However they say it. Uh, This was considered the Moravian Manchester. Oh, that's cool. Oh, everything's got to be compared to right. in England now. Huh? Man, these guys just think they're suck their shit don't stand. Right. The Czech lands, especially Bohemia, became the center of the industrialization due to its natural and human resources. The iron industry. Ooh. The iron industry had developed in the Alpine regions after the year 1750, with smaller centers in Bohemia and Moravia. Hungary. Nope. Hungary, the eastern half of the dual monarchy, was heavily rural, rural with little industry before 1870. Yeah, they're all agriculture. Oh, farmers, yeah. But, which worked out, I guess, for both. Right. Really? Well, 1791, Prague organized the first World's Fair really? slash list of World's they Fairs. They did? Uh, I always thought it was Italy. Or France. Paris, maybe? Yeah. Uh, Bohemia, which is modern-day Czech Republic. That's where it was. Um, wow. That's new. Uh, the first industrial exhibition was on the occasion of coronation of Leopold II as King of Bohemia, which took place in Clementinium. Okay. Um, and therefore celebrated the considerable sophistication of manufacturing methods in the Czech lands during that time period. Technological change accelerated industrialization and urbanization. The GNP per capita grew roughly 1.76% per year. Hmm. 
from 1870 to 1913. That level of growth compared very favorably to that of other European nations such as Britain, which is 1%, France, 1.06%, and Germany, 1.51%. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, so they were better than all of them. Right. However, in comparison with Germany and Britain, the Austro-Hungarian economy as a whole still lagged considerably right. as sustained modernization had begun much later. I mean, what well, obviously. Do? Right, right. Well, let's take a look at Belgium. Belgium was the second country in which the Industrial Revolution took place. Beer is good. The first in continental Europe. Uh, Wallonia, which is French-speaking southern Belgium, they started this in the middle of the 1820s, and especially after Belgium became, became, became an independent nation in 1830. They were like, now we really can. Right. Numerous works comprising uh, coke blast furnaces, as well as puddling and rolling mills, were built in the coal mining areas around Liege and Charleroi. Charleroi. It's got to be like some type of French. I assume since it's Wallonia. French speaking southern Belgium. The leader was a transplanted Englishman named John Cockerwill. All right. It's a hell of a name. Uh, his factories at Serang integrated all stages of production from engineering to supply of raw materials as early as 1825. Well, Wallonia exemplified the radical evolution of industrial expansion. Thanks to coal, the French word was houle, houle, Okay, the region geared up to become the second industrial power in the world after Britain. Mm, but sure. it also pointed out by many researchers with its Cylon Industrial, especially in the Hain, Sambray, and Meuse valleys between <laughs> the Berenage and Liege, there was a huge industrial development based on coal mining and iron making. Okay. Philippi e. Raxon wrote about the period in, uh, after 1830. He said it was not propaganda, but a reality that the Walloon regions were becoming the second industrial power all over the world after Britain. The sole industrial centre. Center outside the collieries and blast furnaces of Walloon and the old cloth making town of Ghent. I don't think his name's Philippe. Philippe. <laughs> I think oh. it's either Felipe or uh, Philip. It's Felipe. <laughs> and I think it's just Philip. It's Felipe. No, Felipe is Philippe. Like... Philippe. Philippe. <laughs> just Philip. Philippe. No. <laughs> yes, it is. But uh, it wouldn't be Philip. Philip. French don't. Philip. Felipe. Philippe. Philippe. Felipe. Felipe. Anyways, Professor Michael Day Coaster. I don't know if it's Day Coaster. <laughs> I don't know if it's Michel, anyway. Hey, it's Michel or Mikel. Mikel or Michel. Right. Anyway, he stated that the historians and the econ economists say economists. Economist? Economist. <laughs> Economist. Hip-hop-anonymous. <laughs> <Economist. laughs> <laughs> <Economist. laughs> <Hip -hop> <laughs> the historians and economists say that Belgium was the second industrial power of the world in proportion to its population and its territory. But this rank is one of the is one of Wallonia, where the coal mines, the blast furnaces, the iron, the zinc factories, the wool industry, the glass industry, the weapons industry, they were all concentrated. Many of the 19th century coal mines in Wall Wallonia are now protected as the World Heritage Sites. Okay. Wallonia was also the birthplace of a strong socialist party and strong trade unions, in particular sociological landscape. At the left, the Salon Industrial, which runs from Mons into the west to Verviers in the east, except for part of the North Flanders. <laughs> <laughs> diggity, diggity. Heidi, Heidi, the old. Wallianos. <laughs> uh, this is another period of industrial revolution after 1920, though. Okay, even if Belgium is the second industrial country after Britain, the effect of the industrial revolution there was very different. In breaking stereotypes, Muriel Nevin and Isabella Devious, Devious have to say, the industrial revolution changed a mainly rural society into an urban one, but with a strong contrast between northern and southern Belgium. During the Middle Ages and the early modern period, Flanders was characterized by the presence of large yellow guy next door. Right. <laughs> large urban centers. At the beginning of the 19th century, this region, with an urbanization degree of more than 30%, remained one of the most urbanized in the world. By comparison, this proportion reached only 17% in Wallonia, barely 10% in the mo most West European countries, and 16% in France, 25% in Britain. Okay. Ain't that nice. 19th century industrialization did not affected traditional urban infrastructure, except in Ghent. Also in Wallonia, the traditional urban network was largely unaffected by the industrialization process, even though the proportion of the city dwellers rose from 17 to 45% between 1831 and 1910, especially in the Hain, the Sambre, and the Meuse valleys between Bornage and Liege, where there was a huge industrial development based on coal mining and iron making. Urbanization was very fast. There in the, uh, these 80 years, the number of municipalities <laughs> with more than 5,000 inhabitants increased from only 21 to more than 100. 
concentrate nearly half of the Walloon pollution <laughs> of the Walloon population in this region. All right. Nevertheless, industrialization remained quite traditional in the sense that it did not lead to the growth of modern and large urban centers, but to a conurbation, conurbation of industrial villages and towns developed around a coal miner factory. Communication routes between these small centers only became populated later and created a much less dense urban morphology than, for instance, the area around Liege, where the old town was there to direct migratory migratory flows. Yeah, <clears throat> everybody still wanted to live in the city, but then they figured out the city actually sucks, right. so they started to go out outside the city, and voila, you got suburbs. Perfect mundo, right? Right. Moving on to old France. The little sissies out there in France. <laughs> Wee wee. I'm kidding, France. Cigarette. <laughs> the Industrial Revolution in France followed a particular course, as it did not correspond to the main model followed by other countries. They never went. Why? Notably, most French historians argue France did not go through a clear takeoff. Instead, France's economic growth and industrialization process was very slow and steady through the 18th and 19th centuries. Steady. However, some stages were identified by Maurice Levy, uh, Levi Le Boyer. It says the France Revolution and pilot. Oh, he states a timeline here, right? Yeah, the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars between 1789 and 1815 was start, and then the industrialization along with Britain between 1815 and 1816. 60 economic slowdown from 1860 to 1905, and then renewal growth after 1905, which makes sense everywhere. Okay. Takes us to Germany. Nobody cares about France. <laughs> Based on its leadership in chemical research in the universities and industrial laboratories, Germany, which was unified in 1871, became dominant in the world's chemical <laughs> in the world's chemical industry in the late 19th century. At first, the production of dyes based on an aniline was critical. Germany's political disunity with three dozen states, yeah, geez, and a pervasive conservatism made it difficult to build railways in right. the 1930s, okay. 1830s. Fantastic. However, by the 1840s, trunk lines linked to major cities. Each German state was responsible for the lines within its own borders. Hmm. Lacking a technological base at first, the Germans imported their engineering and hardware for Britain, but quickly learned the skills needed to operate and expand the railway. Yeah, same way Germans always. Same way Britain did it, though. They imported all the shit until they figured everything out, and then they stopped. Well, obviously, isn't that the way to do it? Yeah, I guess. Makes sense. In many cities, the new railway shops were the centers of technological awareness and training, so that by 1850, Germany was self-sufficient in meeting the demands of the railroad construction, and the railways were a major impetus impetus for the growth of the new steel industry that was about to happen. Observers found that even as late as 1890, their engineering was inferior to Britain's. However, German unification in 1871 stimulated consolidation and nationalization into state-owned companies and further rapid growth. Unlike the situation in France, the goal was the support of industrialization, and so heavy lines crisscrossed Ruhr and other industrial districts provided a good connection to the major ports of the Hamburg and Bremen. Makes sense. By 1880, Germany had 9,400 locomotives, pulling 43,000 passengers and 30,000 tons of freight, and they pulled ahead of France. Good for them. Moving on to Sweden. During the period of 1790 to 1815, Sweden experienced two parallel economic movements. An agricultural revolution with larger agricultural estates, new crops, and farming tools, and the commercialization of farming and a proto-industrialization. Yeah, look at that shit. With some industries being established in the countryside and with workers switching between agricultural work in summer and industrial production in the winter. Fantastic. This led to economic growth benefit in large sections of the population and leading up to a consumption revolution started in the 1820s. Between 1815 and 1850, the pro the proto industries developed into more specialized and larger industries. Look at Sweden. Look at those guys. This period witnessed increasing regional specialization with mining in Bergslagen, textile mills in Schwarzkopfigen, <laughs> and forestry in Norland. Several important institutional changes took place in this period, such as free and mandatory schooling introduced in 1842, free and mandatory. <laughs> Yeah. I would hope it would be free of it. Right. Right? This was the first country to do this in the wild. Oh, okay. That was in 1842. The abolition of the National Monopoly on Trade and Handcrafts in uh, 1846 and a stock company law in 1848. 1850 to 1890, Sweden experienced its first industrial revolution with a veritable uh, explosion in export dominated by crops, wood, and steel. Sweden abolished most tariffs and other barriers to free trade in the 1850s and joined the gold standard in 1873. Large infrastructural investments were made during this period, mainly in the expanding railroad network, 
which was financed in part by the government and in part by private enterprises. From 1890 to 1930, new industry developed with their focus on the domestic market, mechanical engineering, power utilities, and paper making, and textiles. You can't leave textiles. Right. Well, I was in out. Uh, well, here we go to Japan. Let's see what happened to them. Mm. The Industrial Revolution began about 1870 as Meiji period leaders decided to catch up with the West. They were like, all right. Uh, the government built railroads, improved roads, and inaugurated a land reform program to prepare the country for further development. And in, it inaugurated a new Western-based education system for all young people, sent thousands of students to the United States and Europe, oh, and sure. hired more than 3,000 Westerners to teach modern science, math, technology, and foreign languages in Japan. Fantastic. Look at those guys. Uh, 1871, a group of Japanese politicians known as the Iwakura Mission toured Europe and the United States to learn Western ways. The result was a deliberate state-led industrialization policy to enable Japan to quickly catch up. All See, right. these guys ain't stupid. No. Look at them now. All right. uh, the Bank of Japan, founded in 1882, used taxes to fund model steel and textile factories. Education was expanded and Japanese students were sent to study in the West. Modern industry first appeared in textiles, including cotton and especially silk, which was based in home workshops in rural areas. Look at that shit. That's for them. Fantastic. And this is the moment you guys all been waiting for. <laughs> the United States, during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, when the UK and parts of Western Europe began to industrialize, the U.S. was primarily an agricultural and natural resource producing and processing economy. The building of the roads and canals... The introduction of steamboats and building the railroads were important for handling agriculture and natural resource products in large and sparsely populated country of this period. Yeah, the United States is freaking huge, dude. Everybody in Europe's like, you ain't getting. Like, Tennessee's bigger than what? Britain and Belgium and all those guys put together? I don't know if I'll put together, but it's huge. Important American technological contributions <laughs> during the period of the Industrial <laughs> Revolution were the cotton gin oh, yeah. and developments of a system for making interchangeable parts, the latter aided by the development of the milling machine in the United States. Development of machine tools and the system of interchangeable parts was the basis for the rise of the U.S. as the world's leading industrial nation in the late 19th century. Look at that. All right, well, Oliver Anthony invented... <laughs> 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 All right. Oliver Evans invented an automated flour mill in mid 1780s that used control mechanisms and conveyors that uh, so that no labor was needed from the time grain was loaded into the elevator buckets until the flour was discharged into a wagon. Dude, that's fantastic! Wow, this is considered to be the first modern materials handling system, an important advance in the progress towards mass production. You are not kidding. The United States originally used horse-powered machinery for small-scale ap uh, applications such as grain milling, yeah, but eventually right. switched to water power after textile factories began being built in the 1790s. Damn right. As a result, industrialization was concentrated in New England and the northeastern United States, which was fast-moving, which had the fast-moving rivers. Right. right. The newer water-powered production lines proved more economical than uh, horse-drawn productions, clearly. In late 19th century, steam-powered manufacturing overtook water-powered manufacturing and allowed the industry to spread to the Midwest, Ooh, where we flour, all know it, it boomed. It flourish there. Thomas Somers and Cabot and the Cabot brothers founded the Beverly Cotton Manufactory in, 18, in 1787, the first cotton mill in America, the largest cotton mill of its era, and a significant milestone in the research and development of cotton mills in the future. This mill was designed to use horsepower, but... The operators quickly learned that the horse-drawn platform was economically unstable, and they had economic losses for years. Despite the losses, the manufactory served as a playground of innovation, both in turning a large amount of cotton, but also developing the water-powered milling structure used in Slater's Mill. 1793, Samuel Slater, who lived between 1768 and 1835, founded the Slater Mill at Paul Tuckett, Rhode Island. He had learned of the new textile uh, technologies as a boy apprentice in Derbyshire, England, and defied laws against the immigration of skilled workers by leaving for New York in 1789, hoping to make money with his knowledge. Oh, yeah. After founding Slater's Mill, he went on to own 13 more textile mills. Fantastic. Daniel Day established a wool carding mill in the Blackstone Valley at Uxbridge, Massachusetts in 1809, which was the third woolen mill established in the U.S., First was in Hartford, and the second at Watertown, Massachusetts. Fantastic. The John H. Chaffee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor retraces the history of America's hardest working river, the Blackstone. The Blackstone River and its tributaries, which cover more than 70, 45 miles <laughs> from Worcester, Massachusetts to Providence, Rhode Island, was the birthplace of America's Industrial Revolution. Oh, shit. Look at that. And it went down to Pittsburgh and then over to Indiana. Everywhere. I mean, Ohio. 
The old Rust Belt. At its peak, over 1,100 mills operated in this valley, including Slater's Mill, and with the earliest beginnings of America's industrial and technological development. Merchant Francis Cab- Cabot Lowell from uh, Newburyport, Massachusetts, he memorized the design of textile machines on his tour of the British factories in 1810. Damn, how do you memorize that shit? <laughs> Realizing that the War of 1812 had ruined his import business, but that demand for domestic finished cloth was emerging in America. On his return to the United States, he set up the Boston Manufacturing Company. All right. Lowell and his partners built America's second cotton to cloth textile mill at Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, second to the Beverly Cotton Manufactory, which was the first. Right, obviously. <laughs> After his death in 1817, his associates built America's first planned factory town. Oh, shit. Which they it's named after town. him. Was it Lowell? Yeah. Uh, this enterprise was capitalized in a public stock offering and of the first uses of it in the United States. One of the first uses of it. Um, Lowell, Massachusetts, using five and a half miles of canals Damn. and a 10,000 horsepower, Delivered by the Merrimack River is considered by some as a major contributor to the success of the American Industrial Revolution. The short-lived utopia like Waltham Lowell System was formed as a direct response to the poor working conditions in Britain. However, by 1850, especially flowing, especially following the Great Famine in Ireland, the system had been replaced by poor immigrant yeah. labor. Yeah, but all those, Irish guys, <laughs> all those Irish guys came over. and not uh, like a disease in the potatoes or something? Yeah, so they wouldn't grow or some shit. Uh, yeah, all those Irish immigrants came over, and they're like, we'll hire you for a penny a day. Yeah, you ain't kidding. A major United States contribution to industrialization was the development of techniques to make interchangeable parts from metal. Precision metal machining techniques were developed by the U.S. Department of War to make interchangeable parts the for small firearms. The slide lathes. Mm. Development work took place at the Federalist Arsenals at Springfield Armory and Harper's Ferry Armory. Techniques for precision machining use, uh, using machine tools included using fixtures to hold the parts in the proper position, jigs to guide the cutting tools, and precision blocks and gauges to measure the accuracy. The milling machine, a fundamental machine tool, is believed to have been invented by Eli Whitney, who was the government contractor who built firearms as part of his program. All right. Another important invention was the Blanchard lathe, invented by Thomas Blanchard. The lathe, or pattern tracing lathe, was uh, actually a shaper that could produce copies of wooden gun stocks. Yeah. Oh. The use of machinery and the techniques for producing standardized and interchangeable parts became known as the American system of manufacturing. Precision manufacturing techniques made it possible to build machines that mechanized the shoe industry and the watch industry. Oh, shit. Sure. The industrialization of the watch industry started in 1854, also in Waltham, Massachusetts, at the Waltham Watch Company. With the development of machine tools, gauges, and assembling methods adapted to the micro precision required for watches, two one of two of the most important things that anybody can have: good pair of shoes and a, a nice watch or a good working watch. Back in those days, uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about the second industrial revolution. Steel is often cited as the first of several new areas for industrial mass production, which are said to have characterized a second industrial revolution beginning around 1850. Although a method for mass manufacture of steel was not invented until the 1860s, when Sir Henry Bessemer invented a new furnace, which could convert molten pig iron into steel in large quantities. However, it only became widely available in the 1870s after the process was modified to produce more uniform quality. Bessemer steel was being displaced by the open hearth furnace near the end of the 19th century. Now, the second industrial revolution gradually grew to include chemicals, mainly the chemical industries, petroleum, and in the 20th century, the automotive industry, oh, shit. and was marked by a transition of technological leadership from Britain to the United States and Germany. The increasing, and the, the increasing availability of economical petroleum products also reduced the importance of coal and further widened the potential for industrialization. Damn right. A new revolution began with the electricity and the electrification in the electrical industries. The introduction of hydroelectric power generation in the Alps enabled the rapid industrialization of coal, uh, of coal-deprived northern Italy, beginning in the 1890s. Ooh. Northern Italy don't have coal, huh? Wow! By the 1890s, industrialization in these areas had created the first giant industrial corporations with burgeoning, burgeoning, with burgeoning global interest, as companies like United States Steel, General Electric, Standard Oil, and Bayer AG. They joined the railroad and ship companies on the world stock market. Do you know who that is? Standard Oil? Standard Oil is... That's uh, the Rothsteins, yeah. or the Rothschilds. Yeah. Standard Oil Company. Or the Rockefellers, my yeah. bad. The Rockefellers yeah. did that. And that, by, uh, I believe the U.S. Steel is the Rothstein, the Roth... Whatever. It's Carnegie. Carnegie. Yeah, yeah, it's Carnegie. Carnegie. What's Carnegie. Even? Oh, J.P. Morgan, Morgan yeah. too. So U.S. Steel, Schwab, Charles Schwab. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Um, Carnegie Steel, yeah. Stupid. Yep. Man, yep. It's still a company. Mm-hmm. Uh, new industrialist movement adv- advocates for increasing domestic manufacturing while reducing emphasis on a financial based economy that relies on real estate and trading speculative assets. New industrialism has been described as supply side progressivism or embracing the idea of building more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> New, <laughs> new industrialism developed after the China shock. China. That resulted in the loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States after China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. Right, the movement strengthened after the reduction of manufacturing jobs during the Great Recession and when the U.S. was not able to manufacture enough tests or face masks during the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, my goodness. New industrialism calls for building enough housing to satisfy demand in order to reduce the profit in land speculation, to invest in infrastructure, and to develop advanced technology to manufacture green energy for for the world. Hmm. New industrialists believe that the United States is not built on enough productive capital and should invest more into economic growth. Good for you. Guys. Screw this. Talk about indust- the Industrial Revolution, not nowadays. Right. The causes of the Industrial Revolution were complicated and remain a topic for debate. Why? What do you mean with the causes of Industrial <laughs> Revolution? What do you think the cause was? We need to do shit better and faster. <laughs> what an idiot. Geographic factors include Britain's vast mineral resources. In addition to metal ores, Britain had the highest quality coal reserves known at the time. Until the United States came along, baby. As well as abundant water power. Yeah, they did. They do have a lot of water. So the United States. <laughs> Highly productive agriculture. And numerous seaports and navigable waterways. And some historians believe the Industrial Revolution was an o- outgrowth of social and institutional changes brought by the end of the feudalism in uh, Britain after the English Civil War in, in the 17th century. Although feudalism began to break down after the Black Death of the mid-14th century, followed by other epidemics until the population reached a low in the 14th century. All right, this created labor shortages and led to falling food prices and a peak in real wages around 1500, after which population growth began reducing wages. Inflation caused by coinage debasement after 1540, followed by precious metal supply increasing from the Americas, caused land rants. What do they say about the black death? To fall they, in real terms. They just like piled the dead bodies in those oh. streets or something like that. It was like <laughs> mountains of dead bodies or some shit. A third of the world population died or some shit like that. Um, the enclosure movement and the British Agricultural Revolution made food production more efficient and less labor intensive forcing the farmers who could no longer be self-sufficient in agriculture into cottage industry, for example, weaving, and in the longer term, into cities and the newly developed factories. The colonial expansion of the 17th century with the accompanying uh, development of international trade, creation of financial markets, and accumulation of capital are also cited as factors, as is the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Well, a change in marrying patterns to get to getting married later made people able to accumulate more human capital during their youth thereby encouraging economic development. Until the 1980s, it was universally believed by academic historians that technological innovation was the heart of the Industrial Revolution, and the key enabling technology was the invention and improvement of the steam engine. Well, no shit. <laughs> marketing professor Ronald Fulton suggested that innovative marketing techniques, business practices, and competition also influenced changes in the Lewis Mumford has proposed that the Industrial Revolution had its origins in the early Middle Ages, much earlier than most estimates. He explains that the model for standardized max, mass production was the printing press, and that the archetypal model for the industrial era was the clock. Mm, like I said. He also cites the monastic emphasis on order and timekeeping, as well as the fact that medieval cities had their center, uh, had at their center a church with bell ringing at regular intervals as being necessary precursors to a greater synchronization necessary for later, more physical manifestations such as the steam engine. Right. Uh, where do you come to that? <laughs> the presence of the large domestic market should also be considered an important driver of the Industrial Revolution, particularly explaining why it acquired in Britain. In other nations, such as France... Markets were split up by local regions, which often imposed tolls and tariffs on goods traded among them. Internal tariffs were abolished by Henry the Eighth. I am. <laughs> they served in. They I've survived. only been married seven times before. Uh, yeah, married seven. Uh, uh, they survived in Russia until 1753. The tariffs did. And in 1789, in France, they finally went away. In 1839, in Spain, they're like hmm, no one else has tariffs. I guess. Governments grant the limited monopolies to investors on a developing pa- patent system, which is the Statue of Monopolies of 1623. This is considered as influential factor. The effects of patents, both good and ill, on the development of industrialization are clearly il- illustrated in the history of the steam engine. 
the key enabling technology. Yeah, they're like, uh, uh-uh, uh, I made this shit. I must be paid. A lot. Even back then, patents were only like good for like what? I don't know. You a year or two? How much? How they're good now? Some of like five years, ten years. Apparently, we got to go to the causes in Europe. Um, European 17th century colonial expansion, international trade, and creation of financial markets produced a new legal and financial environment, one which supported and enabled 18th century industrial growth. One question of active interest to historians is why the Industrial Revolution occurred in Europe and not in other parts of the world in the 18th century, particularly China, India, and the Middle East, hmm. which pioneered in shipbuilding, textile production, water mills, and much more in the period between 750 and 1100. That right. is true. That is true. Or at other times, like in classical antiquity or the Middle Ages. That's because okay. these guys, did, they found something and they didn't need to fix it. Right? No. They didn't even think about it. Or maybe they're, I don't know. India, especially India and China, though, their workforce was huge, so they were probably pumping shit out right. like freaking machine wood anyway. Yeah. <laughs> a recent account argued that the Europeans have been characterized for thousands of years by freedom-loving culture or- originating from the aristocrat societies of early Indo-European invaders. Many historians, however, have challenged this explanation as being not only Eurocentric, but also ignoring historical context. In fact, before the Industrial Revolution, there existed something of a global economic parity between the most advanced regions and the world economy. No that's what, shit. Uh, that's what that one guy said. Oh, that's what the historian said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> These historians have suggested a number of other factors, including education, technological changes, <laughs> technological changes, um, modern government, modern work attitudes, ecology, and culture all played a factor. China was the world's most technologically advanced country for many centuries. However, China stagnated economically and technologically and was surpassed by Western Europe before the Age of Discovery. Wow. By which time China banned imports and denied entry into foreigners. Wow. Well, that's why Mm -hmm. China was also a totalitarian. A a total, total, totalitarian. Yeah. Totalitarian? Yeah. Totalitarian society. China was also heavily taxed. Hey, they also heavily taxed transported goods. China's bitches, Way to, way to uh, ruin your own nation, you idiots. Always been such a little bitches. Right. They don't want to play right now. I know. Modern estimates of per capita income in Western Europe in the late 18th century are roughly uh, 1500 bucks in purchasing power parity, and Britain had a per capita income of nearly 2000 China is the Ric Flair of the world. Whereas China... the <laughs> dirtiest player in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. And many more ways than just pollution. <laughs> um... Whereas China, by comparison, only had four hundred fifty dollars in per capita income. Historians such as David Lands and sociologist uh, Max Weber and Rodney Stark they credit the different belief systems in Asia and Europe with dictating uh, where the revolution occurred. That could be true. Maybe the right. Chinese people and stuff like that, were like. Our ancestors. Right. This oh, is how we do things. Right. right. The religion and beliefs of Europe were largely produced products of the Judeo Christianity and, and Greek thought. Uh, conversely, Chinese society was founded on men like Confucius, Minucius, Hazafusius, <laughs> <laughs> Lao Tatusius, <laughs> and Buddha Ushis. Right. Confucius, Mencius, Han Fizi, which is legalism, whatever that is. Uh, Lyo Zhu, which is Taoism. Oh, okay. And Buddha, which is Buddhism. Right. Damn, there's a legalism. That's a freaking. Uh, and it's a Chinese philosopher. He was a Chinese philosopher, yeah. Of the legalist school. So this was a, a religion. It's one of six classical schools of thought in the Chinese <clears throat> philosophy. Literally meaning administrative method, standards, house, or school. The Fa school represents branches of what? We can call the men and method. So basically. A religion. Lawmakers and shit. Yeah, it's like a religion. This has resulted in very different ver- worldviews. True. Yeah, with the Chinese society founded on men like yeah. Confucius, Buddha. Yeah. yeah, Hans and Buddha and Sue. Other factors include considerable distance of China's coal deposits, though large, from its cities as well as the then unnavigable Yellow River that connects these deposits to the sea. Dude, that's true because there's still a lot of part of China you can't even navigate. Yeah, they dude. should have never even navigated to the Yellow River. Right. Do you know how many... Uh, uh, on the list of deadliest mat- nas- natural disasters, the Yellow mm. Rivers, like 10 of them, it's killing cool. literally like hundreds of thousands of people no, in China. It's freaking nuts. It's crazy. It floods like every five years like and kills thousands of people. Right, dude. China is, I, don't, I think that whole era of the world, God was like, nobody's supposed to live here. And China was like, watch this. 
Uh, in contrast to China, India was split up into many competing kingdoms after the decline of the Mughal Empire, with the major ones in its aftermath, including the Marathas, the Sikhs, the Bengal, Suba, the Kingdom of Mysore. <laughs> <laughs> this is not your sword. This is my sword. My sword. In addition, the economy was highly dependent on two sectors: agriculture of subsistence, uh, subsistence, 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 and cotton. There appears to have been little technical innovation. It is believed that the vast amounts of wealth were largely stored away in a palace treasuries by monarchs prior to the British takeover. Yeah. That's cool. Economic historian Joel Mocker argued that the political fragmentation, which was the presence of a large number of European states, it made it possible for heterodox ideas to thrive as entrepreneurs, innovators, ideologues, 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 and heretics could easily flee to a neighboring state in the event that the one state would try to suppress their ideas and activities. Like, all right, you want to suppress me? Boom. Take my town, Salt Beach. <laughs> <laughs> this is what set Europe apart from the technologically advanced large unitary empires such as China and India. They provided an insurance agent. <laughs> they they provided. Uh, <laughs> this, this is this is this is this is Sun Lee from Jake Farm or Jake Farm. This is Sun Lee from State Farm. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! They provided an insurance against economical and technological stagnation. Damn, that was, that's a freaking hell of a little thing there. China had both a printing press and movable type. Okay, and India had also had similar levels of scientific and technological achievements as Europe in 1700. Yet, the Industrial Revolution would only occur in Europe, not China and India. Well, in Europe, political fragmentation was coupled with an integrated market for ideas where Europe's intellectuals used lingua franca of Latin, had a shared intellectual basis in Europe's classical heritage and the pan-European institution of the Republic of Letters. In addition, Europe's monarchs desperately needed revenue, pushing them into alliances with their merchant merchant classes. Some groups of merchants were granted monopolies and tax collecting responsibilities in exchange for payments to the state. Located in a region at the hub of the largest and most varied network of exchange in history, Europe advanced as the leader of an industrial revolution. In the Americas, Europeans found a windfall of silver, timber, fish, and maize, leading to historian Peter Stearns to conclude that Europe's industrial revolution Stemmed in great part from Europe's ability to draw disproportionately on the world resources. Right. They didn't do anything. They just got from the rest of the world. Right. Modern capitalism originated in Italian cities and their states. City states? Yes. Uh, yeah, Italian city states around the end of the first millennium, supposedly. The city states were prosperous cities that were independent from feudal lords. Well, that's fantastic. They were largely republics whose govern governments were typically composed of merchants, manufacturers, members of guilds, <laughs> we represent. Uh, bankers, and financiers. Ah, obviously, these guys like let us squeal on in here, guys. <laughs> the Italian city states built a network of branch banks and lead in Western uh, European cities and introduced double entry bookkeeping. Like we, we're not only going to keep your books once, but we're going to do it twice. Italian commerce was supported by schools that taught numeracy and financial calculations through abacus schools. Abacus. abacus schools. All right, well, it leads us to the transfer of knowledge. Transfer of knowledge. Knowledge of innovation was spread by several means. Workers who were trained in the technique might move to another employer or might be poached. Clearly, a common method was for someone to take a study tour, gathering information where he could. During the whole of the Industrial Revolution and for the century before, all European countries and America engaged in study touring. <clears throat> Some nations, like Sweden and France, even trained civil servants or technicians to undertake it as a matter of state policy. In other countries, notably Britain and America, this practice was carried out by individual manufacturers eager to improve their own methods. Well, why wouldn't you do that? Right. Study tours were common then as now and was the keeping of travel diaries. Fantastic. Records made by industrialists and technicians of the period are an incomparable source of information about their methods. Another means for the spread of innovation was by the network of the informal philosophical societies like the Lunar Society of Birmingham, in which members met to discuss natural philosophy which is science mostly, and often its application to manufacturing. The Lunar Society flourished from 1765 to, to 1809, not very long, and it has been said of them that they were 
if you like, the Revolutionary Committee of that most far-reaching of all 18th century revolutions, the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> Other such societies published volumes of proceedings and transactions. For example, the London-based Royal Society of Arts published an illustrated volume of new inventions, as well as papers about them in its annual transactions. <laughs> cool. <laughs> There are publications describing technology, of course. Right. Encyclopedias such as Harris's Lexicon Technicum <laughs> in 1704 and Abraham Rees's Cyclopedia. The Cyclopedia. He said, <laughs> all right. We're not going to put the N. <laughs> no E-N, It's an Encyclopedia. Uh, from uh, 18 to 1802 to 1819 contained much of value. Cyclopedia <laughs> contains an enormous <laughs> amount of information about the science and technology of the first half of the Industrial Revolution. Very well illustrated by fine engravings. Oh, that's cool. Foreign printed sources such as the descriptions des arts et metiers and Diderot's Encyclopédie, <laughs> Pidae, uh, explain foreign methods with fine engraved plates as well. Periodical publications about manufacturing and technology begin to appear in the last decade of the 18th century, and many regularly included notice of the latest patents. Foreign periodicals such as the Annals des Mines. Published accounts of travels made by French engineers who observed British methods on study tours. Wow. There was also this Protestant work ethic that they say. There was another theory that the British advance was due to the presence of an entrepreneurial class, which believed in progress, technology, and hard work. The existence of the class is often linked to the Protestant work ethic, which is, uh, you can see Max Weber for that, and the particular status of the Baptists and the dissenting Protestant sectors, such as the Quakers and the Presbyterians. That, is there any Quakers left? Of Just an over there, huh? Not here. Oatmeal. <laughs> uh, they had flourished with the English Civil War. Reinforcements of confidence in the rule of law, which followed establishment of the prototype of constitutional monarchy in Britain in the glorious revolution of 1688 and the emergence of a stable financial market. They're based on the management of the national debt by the Bank of England. This contributed to the capacity for and interest in Private financial investment in industrial ventures. That's such the stupid thing in the world. They found an easier way to do stuff and cheaper. That's why. That's the, the only explanation there is. Right. Dissenters <laughs> found themselves barred or discouraged from almost all public offices, as well as education at England's only two universities at the time. Uh, although they were still free to study at Scotland's four universities. Good for them. When the restoration of the monarchy took place, a membership in the official Angelican Angelic, Angelican Church became mandatory due to the <laughs> Test Act. They thereupon became active in banking, manufacturing, and education. The Unitarians, in particular, were very involved in education by running dissenting academies, where, in contrast to the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, and schools such as Eton and Harrow, much attention was given to mathematics and the sciences, areas of scholarship vital to the development of manufacturing technologies. Cool. Historians sometimes consider the social factor to be extremely important along with the nature of the national economies in the world. While members of these sectors were excluded from certain circles of the government, they were considered fellow Protestants to a limited extent by many in the middle class, such as traditional financiers or other businessmen. Given this relative tolerance and the supply of capital, the natural outlet for the more enterprising members of these sectors would be to seek new opportunities and technologies created in the wake of scientific revolution of the 17th century. Obviously, this is just stupidity. All right, we're going to take a look at some criticisms. We're almost <laughs> done with this. <laughs> the Industrial Revolution has been criticized for causing ecological uh, collapse, mental illness, pollution, and detrimental social systems. It has also been criticized for valuing profits and corporate growth over life and well-being. Isn't that everything? Multiple movements have arisen which reject aspects of the Industrial Revolution, such as the Amish or primitives, primitivists. Uh, okay. Individualism, humanism, and harsh conditions by the revolution. Humanists and individualists criticized the Industrial Revolution for mistreating women and children true. and turning men into work machines that lacked autonomy. Ooh. Critics of the Industrial Revolution promoted a more interventious state Venturist state and form new organizations to promote human rights. Oh my gosh, oh. I'm a critic of the industrial revolution. Oh, Shut the fuck up, idiots. Oh man, primitivism. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what these uh, primitive people think. They argue that the industrial revolution have created an unnatural frame of society in the world, and the world is which humans need to adapt to an unnatural urban landscape in which humans are perpetual, perpetual cogs without personal anatomy. 
Certain primitivists argue for a return to the pre-industrial society, which others argue that the technologies such as modern medicine and agriculture are all positive for humanity, assuming they, can, they are controlled and serve humanity and have no effect on the natural environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Brings us to pollution and ecological collapse. Ecological. Uh, right. The Industrial Revolution has been criticized for leading to immense ecological and habitat destruction. Certain studies state that over 95% of species have gone extinct since humanity became the dominant species on Earth. Always been the dominant species on Always, Earth. Always, yeah. And it has also led to immense decrease in the biodiversity of life on Earth. The Industrial Revolution has been stated as an inherently unsustainable and will lead to eventual collapse of society, mass hunger, starvation, and resource scarcity. It never happened. Piss off, there, we just We just proved that there's so much land for animals to do what they want to do. Also, so much land that we don't even know what's underneath the right. land or in the land get to get the natural resources from. The Anthropocene, whatever that is. The Anthropocene Anthrop- is... Anthropocene? An- Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is a proposed epoch or mass extinction coming from humanity. Oh, oh man. Since the start of the Industrial Revolution, humanity has permanently changed the oath, such as immense decrease in biodiversity and the mass extinction caused by the Industrial Revolution. The effects include permanent changes to the Earth's atmosphere and soil, forests. The mass destruction of the Industrial Revolution has led to the ca- catastrophic impacts on the Earth. Most organisms are unable to adapt, leading to mass extinction, with the remaining undergoing ev- evolutionary rescue as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Which they mean by cloning. Permanent changes in the distribution of organisms from human influence will become identifiable in the geologic record. Researchers have documented the movement of many species into regions formerly too cold for them, often at rates faster than initially expected. This has occurred in part as a result of the changing climate, but also in response to farming and fishing and to accidental introduction of non-native species to newer areas through global travel. That's true. The ecosystem of the entire Black Sea may have changed during the last 2,000 years as a result of nutrient and silica input from eroding deforested deforested lands along the Danube River. So this turned into fucking activism. Um, just like Wikipedia always does. During the Industrial Revolution, an intellectual and artistic hostility towards the new industrialization developed, associated with the Romantic movement. Romanticism revered the tra- traditionalism of real life and recoiled against upheavals caused by industrialization. I get it. Urbanization and the wretchedness, wretchedness and the wretchedness of the working classes. Its major exponents in English included that the artist and poet William Blake and poets William Woodworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, John Keats, Lord Byron, and Percy Bysshe Shelley. Bish. <laughs> Bysshe Bish Shelley. Bysshe Shelley. <laughs> yeah. The movement stressed the importance of nature and art and language in contrast to monstrous machines and factory. The dark satanic mills of Blake's poem and did those... And did those feet in ancient time. That's a poem. I guess. Mark Shelley's... I bet you better rhyme. Right. Right. There it is. Uh, And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded there? Builded? (laughs) Among these dark satanic mills? Oh, fuck off, William Blake. Fuck off, dude. Right. And then Mary Shelley's Frankenstein reflected consoins that scientific progress might be too edged. What makes a monster? Make a monster. <laughs> <laughs> French rota- romanticism likewise was highly critical of industry. Oh, good for you. Fuck you and your fucking and romanticism. That's that, huh? Bullshit, bullshit ass fucking. That's a stupid ass ending to the article. Right. Romanticism. Get the hell out of here. Stupid. End it with climate change. And right. Romanticism. Fucking, ooh, Dennis Trump again. What about. Uh, I like how in the critic they didn't give us any. Uh, they gave us a whole section on criticism, but they didn't give us a whole section on uh, uh, applauding the fucking right. Industrial Revolution and shit. Right. Get the fuck out of here. Right. Yeah, dude. Whatever. What are we doing next? Wow. I mean, that was a, overall a decent, too long of an article, but... Uh, I mean... <laughs> there you go. That was the Industrial Revolution. Oh, and hopefully... Oh, my. We don't have a long one like that again. Oh, me we gotta too. mix it up. On the yeah, term. No, so no. Let's learn about the tomato or something, you know? Hey. How the hell we land on that when we had all those ones to land on before? I don't know. Well, let's take a look at the categories. You guys know we spin a wheel. We got like 25 categories, and each Please. category has like 50 articles plus in them. Please could be a good so, category. Let's see what our category is going to be. Don't be Earth or anything like that. 
you stupid bastard. Cities. Cities. Oh, no. Why can't it be anything fun like bands? <laughs> I know. That would have been great. Jeez. Cities. Oh, no. oh, geez. There's 33 of them, and they're just, what do we got? Give us something cool, at least. We are going to Pompeii. Venice. Venice work. Venice, Europe. Actually, Pompeii would have been nice, too. Venice, Europe. Let's take a look at Venice, Europe. At least we would have got to talk about. <laughs> That's not that bad. <laughs> but there's, there's no reason. I mean, it's, I guess. It's, uh, some good stuff happening, I bet. Their architecture, their music styles, education, good stuff like that. All right, good for them. Pretty cool. Venice. Dude, isn't Venice the one that's like surrounded by water? Yeah, there's literally, the there's like streets of water and shit. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right there. Cool. When the moon hits your eye, like a big piece of pie, that's some more. Little dude on the back of the boat. It's like that in certain yeah. parts of Louisiana, too, isn't it? I don't know. Pretty sure. That's what you've got, dude. How the yeah. fuck are those houses even still standing? It's a lot of moisture. Right. And a lot of people had coughs. <laughs> <laughs> And respiratory problems. Probably. A lot of humidifier, dehumidifiers. <laughs> right. Bitch. You know, uh, bitch, that humidifier is doing nothing. <laughs> there's a, there's a, uh, an unending uh, supply of water right out your window. <laughs> well, there's that. Well, that kind of sucks. I mean, it's cool, but no, but man. Uh, and that will do it for us in Industrial Revolution. Reminder, go to the YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Give us a subscription there and um, do some liking, commenting. And also on Spotify or Apple. Do the same. Review, comment. Do that shit for us, guys. And we shall be back next week for an enthralling episode of According to Wikipedia with Venice, Italy. Hey, at least we're learning some things, I guess. Right. We'll see you next week with the Mouth of Michiganders. Bang, bang.